Is God real? Science is better than the arts. Sanjay is like the living, breathing, you know, Swadesh movie happening, where this guy goes to like a village and then he's making a dam for them and you know the electricity is flowing and one auntie is like saying bitchly like it's awesome man. Controversy brewing. Our main motto is to like advance students even though they lack resources. Would you be open to sharing the playbook behind your psychometric analysis? If you have a, a new mobile phone, you would be excited, but eventually you get used to it. Same way, children initially they would be excited about it, but sometimes they would lose their interest. So those who don't have exposure on anything, we would be exposing them to various domains. When we say tech revolution, we know a lot about ChatGPT, generative AI technologies, and I think just being having that access to digital education will give you a heads up. You walked into a trap today. Yeah, that really opened my mind. The world is undergoing a tech revolution, and we at SciReach we just want to make STEM education more accessible to everybody, so people, regardless of their financial situation, have access to the resources and support they need. We have a huge tech revolution right now, and we have to go with the tech revolution and advance ourselves with the tech revolution, but. There are lots of la- lack of resources in the world, and the stu- and many students are do- are not aware of the upcoming technologies, or uh, so since they don't have access to proper education. So uh, in, through our science reach, we are aiming to make this uh, bridge a gap between the lack of resources and the students to make them advance themselves along with the tech revolution. How are you doing this? So we are doing this by educating our uh, students of developing and underdeveloped nations uh, by providing them a hands-on curriculum by giving project-based learning and then educating students on various upcoming technologies like generative AI, coding, robotics uh, through uh, various resources we have. And we are giving them, pro- we would be giving them projects to build on them own selves with our guidance. Guys, we hear this so often now. Tech revolution, generative AI, you know, computer science is just taking over the world. Robots are gonna come, blah, 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 right? What exactly do you mean by the words tech revolution? And what exactly is happening that is making you go in the direction of STEM education is very important. We're now in partnerships with Namibia, India, and we're talking to a few countries in Latin America. These countries, there are so many people who just do not have access to a laptop or a computer, and they're missing out on on taking advantage of the opportunities in the time that we live in. So I think that's what made us want to go into that direction. And also both of us um, have been STEM enthusiasts since we were 10. We've been in research. We loved computer science, so we thought this, would, this is something we're passionate about and can also help people. So that's what it's about. So guys, Akhil and I are both also from STEM backgrounds. We are very strong proponents of STEM education. So the reason I think we want to know more about this is because STEM education in a lot of places is approached very differently. There is a very traditional approach where you're not using too many devices when you're doing more theory and your practicals and all are written down like how I at least studied in India. I've seen that improve. Then there is the other end of the spectrum where in the US and things like that, you're spending most of your time on the computer where people aren't really taking notes on pen and paper. Everything is done on the computer. So what is what are some of the methods that you all are using? Sanjay, you mentioned there were various resources. Can we get some specificity on these resources? You can use an example if that'll help. Because I feel like we can get lost in the vagarities. And this is not a marketing pitch. So let's get into the specifics. Let's understand what it is and how you all are making the difference that you all want to make. So our approach is entirely different from various organizations that are providing STEM education. So what we do is first we do perform a psychometric analysis on a student. So what do you mean? What do you mean by the psychometric analysis is like we would be getting to know the student on a personal level on what their interests are, what how they we would test their cognitivity, creativity by using various tests 
and getting connected with them personally would allow us to be uh, able to question them and get a proper or honest answer. So once we are done with the cognitive and the creative test, which is called a psychometric analysis, we would group a particular students who have a set of interests. And then we would be produ uh, providing a customized resources or customized learning platform to them with our, we have a membership instead of we providing just teaching resources, we have a membership program where we would categorize the students based on their interests and their cognitivity or creativity or etc. through our psychometric test. And then we would be giving a customized course to each of them through personal mentorships. Like if they, uh, so for example, a student is interested in robotics, we would understand what is robotics considered to him. Uh, after analyzing his progress and then uh, his interest further, we would be giving him a project. At the end of the uh, mentorship program, he would be building a project of his idea. So when we started engineering in the US, it was it's, it's a very different approach to how it is done in India. So in India, you give an exam and you get the scores back. Then once you have the scores in your hand, then you get to, you know, you, you get to apply to different types of engineering. And then you might or might not get into the one you want to get into. You know, I, I've heard my friends say that I wanted mechanical engineering, but I ended up in textile engineering or some stuff like that has, I, I've heard it before. In the US though, you get the first year of engineering, which is common grounds. It's all the same for everybody. I don't know about IU, but in our college, yeah, oh gosh, yeah. In our college, the first year was common for everybody, and then you would go on and select what you would like to do or what you would like to pursue. And I love the approach you guys are having. I feel like there's a problem though, and the problem is that when you're approaching, you know, students from these countries which may not have all the access in the world, such as countries in Africa who are not very well to do, they might not even know that they like or they can like a given subject. You know, they might not know the existence of a given subject. The reason I like electrical engineering is because I had a PlayStation and I was able to open it up and, you know, see, see it for parts. Are you addressing that issue in any manner? Are you able to address that issue? So whatever Sanjay described with the psychometric analysis and customization was done because we found some gaps, but initially what we had was we were working with the girls coding camp back in India and we just exposed them to different technologies. Like we had like a scratch animation thing. So we would show them different things. So it was like a one month program. So we, we every day we would like show them different things. And Sanjay also had another um, initiative called Cure 369 that he was working on where he was working with people and teaching them different things. And along the process, when they were exposed to certain technologies, some some people were like, oh, we like web development more, or we like physical theory, whatever, we were teaching them a little bit better. And some of them like robotics. So I feel like just if if they have no idea of, what, of where they want to go, taking a general approach first and being exposed to the ideas is where we would recommend them. But if they, if someone already has a decent background and they want more mentorship and like getting a product or a research paper done, then we also have memberships for that, if that makes sense. Each person has a certain horizon because that is what they see. Today, you and I might have a similar horizon because of our exposure levels are similar. However, when you go to a remote place, which is disconnected from the world to a larger extent, or which is disconnected from today's world as we know it, how do you bridge that gap? How do you broaden that person's horizon so that that person knows that something like robotics even exists? We have, again, we have a limited understanding of that because we've not been operating for a long time. We've been doing this model. But I think in the, in the things that I've seen where we just give them like a general exposure to different subjects, like in that, at least the one month program that we did, where we just go through different things that they've never known before. Like we, we, we've shown them like editing or some kind of apps and things. They've never seen that before. So I think they are more interested, like, oh, what's that? But 
again, that's an interesting thing that maybe we can look into of like, they don't have background into this, but the people that we've dealt with have had some level of like ideas of what tech looks like. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so initially when we got get a new thing to learn or new thing to use, we would be excited, right? So for example, uh, if you have a, a new mobile phone, you would be excited when you well, initially started using it, but eventually you get used to it so that you you don't care about it. Uh, so same way, it's same for the knowledge. So when we are going to expose different uh, children on who doesn't have exposure on anything, uh, so we uh, initially they would be excited about it, but eventually some students may get uh, the show the same interest on the same domain, but sometimes they would lose their interest. So what we do is we even we would be pro using our psychometric analysis on a weekly basis uh, to check their interest level. So initially we would be exposed. Uh, so those who don't have exposure on anything, we would be exposing them to various domains like uh, site research, innovation, or the uh, so a rocket science. So when we learn uh, say about rocket science, it would be like uh, uh, it would be abstract. But eventually when we learn it, so it would be simple like that. Similarly for the computer science. So as the technology builds, everything would be like, uh, we would lose interest when we use it eventually. I love how Sanjay just said that rocket science, you would think it is difficult, but it is like super simple. So, you know, I, I think you might be one of the very few people in the, on the planet who get to say those words. So we would love to know a little bit about both of you. Who are you? What are you doing? And why are you the ones going for this problem? Uh, so I'm Sanjay. Uh, I'm Sanjay, and I'm pursuing undergrad at Arizona State University. And I'm also a st undergrad researcher who's uh, doing research on the algae and organisms. Uh, so my my aim is to like uh, uh, de make every technology accessible to all, and then. Uh, so eventually, I we started SciReach to make education and technology accessible to all. So I had innovated various innovations like I hybrid electricity harvester, which generates around 15,000 watt of power output through uh, wind, solar, thermal vibrations, and electromagnetic radiation. And then I developed a visual a walking stick, uh, autonomous walking sticks for visually impaired people and wave powered ocean cleaner to clean the plastic waste in the ocean and then use uh, or use certain organisms to degrade the plastics. So, and then I'm, I had also published research papers on quantum computing uh, to make how underdeveloped or developing countries can access quantum computing through various cloud servers technology and wireless power transmission and 3D bioprinting technologies and the, for the triple negative breast cancer. So these, I have worked on various domains. So I want to uh, provide education, the knowledge, what I gain to the others. So we started the site. So I'm Anshu. I'm a sophomore. I'm also studying computer science and AI. Um, and I'm, I also work part time in the Center for Women in Tech. Um, as I can, as you can tell, I'm really passionate about edu educating people on different technologies. I've had a nonprofit back home when I was in India, and it was also helping girls get access to education. I think different minority groups face um, barriers to education, but where depending on their socioeconomic background. So that's why I really wanted to start something like this. Um, my past research experience, I've worked on face recognition bots in crime using deep learning and things like that. So I've had a lot of opportunities in my life where I was able to research and publish research papers and get exposure um, to mentorship and things like that. And I've noticed not everyone in my circle had those opportunities. So I think this is my way of giving back and I've always appreciated it. Guys, y'all are two sophomores in college. I have never... I'm a freshman. He's a freshman. <laughs> Even more so. There you go. Holy shit. <laughs> For context, He's guys, this one is 18 years old, one is 19 years old. Bo one is 18 bordering 19, the other was 19 bordering 20 maybe. 
you guys do you realize what you just said like researcher application grant quantum computing i mean like guys you you realize the magnitude of what you all have just said yeah since we got the opportunity you've said it so easily and the dream bro the dream the dream is make tech accessible to all like that's the dream and you know to be able to dream that at such a young age and i was just trying to hide beer from my ra at your age like i i didn't i didn't really care <laughs> for context like okay so my parents from when i was younger they really wanted to go go to an american university so they put me in this high school where they were like oh grades are important but like you have to build your resume so like you know you you have an easier chance at college or whatever and i was in ib and they would always emphasize things like oh do that research apply for everything and i think it's kind of like that environment which i grew up in which was very competitive i never dreamed of going to american university till my end of 12th grade <laughs> so my i was like going to iit uh, my dream was like going, attending iit madras so i was preparing everything for it but eventually i participated in one of an one of the innovation contest that's organized by vivo india and in there i see saw various students presenting their innovations or researches and i was awestruck and i eventually lost the competition for the first time uh, and then uh, that motivated me to go for the same context contest next time and i won the national level contest and that made a spark in me to go into the iit madras for the research and one of the mentor i got in the iit madras told me to go for the american university that would be like more practical for you and then once i finished my 12th grade exams final exams i started applying for it and then i eventually got it till then i never thought of going to america sanjay you were telling us before we started recording and we're going to get you to, you to, to talk about that once more but you were telling us about some of the projects that you have been a part of and so you were telling us about the kind of stuff that you've been doing in the non-profit space in india before you came into like these are things that you read about in books like these are not i never thought i'd meet or come across students of this caliber so guys i hope you appreciate what you have done and value that to the extent because this is amazing stuff and you're planning your obviously your goals are even higher and you're looking to make tech as accessible to everyone you know which is the way forward like we often have this thing in when we're talking to startups and everything like that and everyone goes like oh are you a tech startup or are you no or are you not a tech startup or something like that and there's this very popular saying now that everything from now onwards is either going to be tech tech enabled tech assisted or tech something there is not going to be a startup or a company that exists which is started from now onwards which has no tech in it so i hope you guys realize what you all are doing like this is some amazing amazing work guys let's have a deep dive into stem what exactly do you mean by stem for the people who don't know and why is it important i think stem um in its raw form stands for science technology engineering and math and i think it's important because i feel like it has the largest um operate barrier to access because um with regards to stem education there is a lot of requirements for researching mentorship and support i'm not saying arts and everything doesn't need that but stem just has a lot more barriers to access and we think by us having that personal approach and giving them the resources it just makes it be seem less daunting the shade you just threw on the art world you know vishnu the naya podcasters and you just like you're just like you guys are not doing important work no i'm not saying they're not important i just feel like not as important at least from what i what i what i've seen a lot of women in my extended families they were just encouraged to do like arts or commerce they were like science is for like the guys and everything that's what i've heard so i'm like I'm, yeah i don't want to go into that but that kind of thing 
controversy brewing. <laughs> Anshu says science is better than the arts. <laughs> Oh no. Oh no. This is going to be a short and we're going to like promote it. <coughs> we we found our we found our title. I stand by it. I feel like I feel like art okay, I'm going to get hate for this, but I feel like art's like a hobby. Like you can enjoy art, but like science is like Let us know if you want to cut this out. <laughs> so controversial. Guys, but I feel like even if you were to start a podcast or like anything, inge- I feel like engineering is the way to go. It just opens your brain to different things. The podcast will open your brain to different things. Like you just threw shade on art. <laughs> Did you know you were going to throw shade on art? <laughs> I have a very different take on this. I think it's not to do with art or history or social or geography or science or engineering or anything like that. I think it's a way of thinking. So you you get into like you know linear thinking or lateral thinking or analytical thinking as you have it in a lot of these fields and if you can train your brain to think in that way like even someone who even an archaeologist has to think in a very you know analytical logical way so it's about promoting that way of thinking where you can get your reasoning across to somebody Vishrut is throwing shade on archaeologists. No, I am not. So we we have already shit on art and archaeologists by now. Sanjay, who is next? Who are we throwing shade on next? I am not going to shade on anyone. So according to me, the science is the base of ed- everything. <laughs> so it makes us to think interdisciplinarily on everything. Sanjay has thrown shade on everything other than science. <laughs> <laughs> Sanjay is just like science is king. My belief is science exists everywhere. So now you do what you want to with that information. No, everything builds up on science, right? Uh, so even if you want to host a podcast, you need to use science of music sound. Oh my god! That's so cute. everything is science, Bobby. So. Uh, so making students learn science. So Sanjay is God real. We're not getting into that, Sanjay. Enough of controversy. When you go into the science is the mother of everything, this is the most obvious question that has to that has to follow it. Yeah, I think so. God may or may not exist. Uh, my belief is nine ninety eight percent God exists. So nobody knows what's the origin of the universe or what happens before that. Until we get a proper evidence of if God is there or not there, we are in the dilemma until then. But then we are on a belief system. We are no longer in the science world. But you just said that everything comes from science. So go here or there. So what science believes is results or the experiments or we get something. So until now, we haven't get a result on whether the God really exists or not. So until then, I don't believe whether he exists or not. So I'm not sure about that. A no result is closer to a negative result than a no result is to a positive result. No. Uh, so it is in between, right? Zero is between negative infinity and positive infinity. But 98% is much closer to positive than to negative. I'm not sure what to Guys, I feel like that's so hard. That is so hard. Because I was thinking about it. And the only reason I believe in God is like, my dad kept telling me this when I was growing up, like the gravity of this earth is perfect. Like if it was a little bit higher, a little bit lower, the universe wouldn't be what it is. So I feel like there's an explanation as to why everything is so precisely the way it needs to be, if that makes sense. And that makes me want to believe like there is a creator. It's pretty logical like to me. If everything is the way it needs to be, And everything that is, is created by humans in the current world because half the animal kingdom is dead. Most of them are extinct. There are barely any species left. Most of the population on this planet is either humans or are like things that humans consume like cows and pigs and dogs, which is like more mental consumption. Then wouldn't human be the god in your case scenario? I feel like there are some laws of nature like gravity, acceleration, things like that. And I feel like we're all different characters with different abilities. Like humans have different abilities and 
I think we have more power to affect other people. But why would God make it such that humans would have more powers than other people if everything was the way it is supposed to be? And this is a course which you guys will have an option to take in your school. I don't know about IU, but you will have an option to take, especially in Purdue, where you can go. This is called Philosophy 101 and you start with the conversation of God. But coming back to topic, guys. Anshu, why do you believe that women are not in science? Why why is there such a discrepancy given that half the world is women? You know, that's very interesting to me because I've always thought that. I've always deeply been fascinated by why in all of my engineering classes, all of my computer classes, there's like 160 guys and like five girls. I've always been so... But I feel like there is a lot of stigma and discrimination that at least when I was back home in India, I was seeing. Um, I was, I think, 15 when I started my first research position. And most of these people were older guys and they would just look at you like, like, honestly, like you're stupid. There's just that feeling of like isolation that I've experienced and um not be not feeling like it was worthy or I was fitting in and the professor is like if I made a kind of a mistake back when I was re- researching in India the way that I was treated I feel like there's just so much negative experiences associated with that so a lot of women at least even in America sometimes I see people like switching majors because just they just don't feel like they fit in here um and for me I think it's about challenging those beliefs and trying to be a part of something so I can inspire other girls to do do the same. Especially where I come from, my parents are more liberal, but I've seen a lot of my sisters just not be able to pursue their dreams um, and not do research or not because they didn't feel like they were smart enough. They they didn't feel like they were good enough because they were hearing all the voices. So I think that's why. You know, society we live in, is evolving faster than we can comprehend while we are still these cave people monkey you know things which are trying to make sense of it and the world that our parents lived in the world their parents lived in and the world we live in are like so drastically different to each other that taking experiences from from any of these worlds and putting it to any of these worlds is completely unfair and i i cannot digest it I don't like the fact that, you know, somebody who will be of my mom's age will tell someone who is of my age or of your age as to women should do this. And I I believe that all of these shoulds should not exist. So I would like your particular experiences that led you to science, which other women are not being led to, you know, the, the specifics. So when I was seven years old, my dad enrolled me in my first programming class. And by the time I was 10, I was, I was, since I was doing it since like for three years and I had like access to private tutors and stuff, I was really good at it. So when I reached middle school around seventh grade, I was going to these hackathons back in Hyderabad. Um, it's through IT Hyderabad. I won the girls in code championship. I just felt like I was getting a lot of validation from it. If you know, if you understand what I mean, I feel like I was getting a lot of appreciation and awards and it just made me feel good about myself. And a lot, and then I was like, Oh, I'm good at it. So why not keep doing it? And then I realized not a lot of girls do science. Um, I'm like, Oh, like I need to do this. I need to prove that I can do this because I used to hear it all the time. Like, Engineering is for the guys. Engineering is for the guys. And that was also one of the reasons. But I think just the sheer amount of exposure that I had when I did my first research with um, deep learning, I was just fascinated by like the possibilities of like identifying um, the crime rate through the technology. It was just so fascinating to me as I had these different exposure and experiences that I eventually just fell in love with computer science. So I, I told that like initially I was like, I don't, I'm not sure what I was to supposed to do. So I was like studying different things, what I like, or just studying random books. Uh, so one thing is I, one of the teacher 
inspired me so they told me like uh, they their way of teaching science made me to pursue that so i was having a physics teacher when i was in eighth grade so his way of teaching inspired me and so he told that how physics is governing our life and then i built an innovation that is the hybrid electricity harvester i did it when i was grade 11 and then I, when I showcased it, it made me uh, something that I was useful to this society. Like I'm doing something to the society that helps in mitigating various problems. And then uh, one of my org initiative that ran back in India is Q369 waste. We, in our school, used the bio waste, the food waste, and generated into menu. And then we provided to the surrounding horticulture sites. And we planted various plantations. So these initiatives made me to go into science and pursue engineering. And one of the major part is Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam and his talks and watching his videos and works made me to go into the aerospace engineering specifically. Sanjay is like the living, breathing, you know, Swades movie happening where this guy goes to like a village and then he's making a dam for them and you know the electricity is flowing and one auntie is like saying bijli like it's awesome man like you know every indian watches that movie and thinks that i should do this i am so educated and now both of you are here trying to educate these people in such living conditions you know actually living that kind of a life now that you are educating yourselves in your given fields how do you take this forward what's next for sai reach so we've currently started talks with um partnerships in the media like we said we were mostly operating out of india and doing like remote work so now we're in partnerships with namibian organizations and then we've started talks with an organization in ukraine which helps us connect displaced ukrainians and we're doing one in Latin America. So I think our eventual vision is to be able to be reach every developing country in every continent and be able to have some sort of presence there so we can access, um, we can help a wider section of the population. How are you making these connections? So, for example, the Namibian one was through, actually most of it is through Instagram and Googling. So once I find a list of organizations on Google that I seem interested in, like, I would read their vision and mission statements and their operations. And if it's kind of close to what we want to achieve, like a part of it is close enough, I would email them um, and then we would get on a pitch call. And then I, me and Sanjay, would we would pitch ourselves to them, our ideas, and see how that partnership would look like. We've gotten our fair share of rejections. And some, um, I think three of, three of them have accepted our proposal so far. So it's it's mostly like Instagram, Google, emails, and then we get on a pitch call. And then if they're good with that, then we have our, they introduce us to their board and then we introduce them to our staff and we see how that collaboration looks like. And when you say your staff, what is currently your team and how does it work once you, once you get into partnership with someone? So we're currently a very small team. We have only about like 10 people. So we have a few people who help us with the hiring of new interns who help us with social media editing, or like we have a website up. So like the checking our email newsletters, things like that. And then a few of them are specifically just like mentorship and like helping the students that we have and taking coding classes and things like that. So it's a very small team of 10. So we just work a lot within our capacity to make this possible. So when you're saying you introduce students to different areas like robotics or you know, deep learning or rocket science or whatever it may be, how do you go about this? Is it all online or because you're saying these people don't really have access to too much technology. So how are you introducing them to these different fields and what is the ways that you do this? Mostly what happens is when we establish a partnership is the person who is our point of contact has some access to a computer or a laptop. And usually it's one screen and all the kids gather around the screen because they don't have a lot of technological resources. So we do a Zoom call and we do remote calls. And if one of them, we also have like an hour live sessions where we can like, if they have like doubts or something, 
we help them. And if they want personal time within that one hour, they can do that. We want to expand it to include more so we're able to help everyone personally. But at this point, we don't really have the resources or the staff to do one with everybody in that condition. I feel that your aim would be to get to as many kids as you could in the world, right? What that could also mean is that a lot more shops like yourself should pop up in the world who can reach kids that you might not. And we would like to push that narrative. So if someone does want to, you know, wake up tomorrow, listen to this podcast and be like, shit, I should do this. What would be the way to start? And what would be some of the major hurdles that they will face in order to, you know, make it happen? I don't know if someone can start it like at this scale initially, just because we, me and Sanjay, we've always had experiences leading up to this. So I would think, I would say even if you don't have the resources or things like that, the first step would be to start teaching someone that you know within your circle. Like if you, for example, you have a domestic help and their, their child is interested in physics and he's looking over your physics textbook and he's like, he's so curious about what that is. Just take the time, take an hour and like help them make their curiosity develop. I think that's where it started for me. Back when I was 10 years old, I loved teaching one of my domestic help son how to do the coding stuff that I was doing. So I think even small things like that within your community, if you're not able to reach people like in different countries and establish partnerships like we're trying to do, just look for within your neighborhood and try to find ways that you can affect people you already know. I think that's the way to go. Let's go one step let's go one step deeper. What if you do want to set up the corporation? What if you can get the people with experience? What if you have the resources? How do you just start off and reach like, you know, you guys have the reach of five thousand kids now, maybe more if I'm not mistaken. If I can do all of that, how do I start? How do I get the teachers? How do I, you know, make a mark so we have enormous resources in online resources right now to recruit or everything so first we have to find the problem the students are facing right now in each region so that's the main starting point would be so each region would have different problems and each student would face a different problem so some of them won't get a concept easily or some of them has yeah, I grab the concept or do, doesn't know how to apply on that. And some of them don't have resources, so they couldn't be able to learn it. Or some of them may have heavy resources, but they don't want to learn it. So we have to find the main problems on a particular region. And then, uh, and then we have to like analyze what are, the, how can we develop solutions to solve those problems? So for example, uh, we have developed our solutions by considering the psychometric analysis to find the each student's strengths, abilities, and etc. So likewise, everyone according to their region can act uh, by finding the problem first and then developing a small or small scale solution. And then first they have to test it with a small group of students if they work or not. So after testing with a small group of students, they can scale up their test to the other next level. So, and they can work with other other group of students and they can get some high school teachers, for example, who has uh, interest in volunteering to teach others. And then, uh, and so they can use their help and they can use the school's help uh, or, or the or, or in non-profit organization's help to work on the developing students. So eventually, once they start with that, everything would be a chain reaction. So if we are good enough, uh, so like uh, saying is that an uh, insect goes and goes for the flower, the flower doesn't go for the insect, for the food, right? So the flower stays where it is, the insect goes where the flower is. So likewise, the students would come to us uh, by word of mouth, by anything, according to our quality of, of how we are teaching them. So that's how it would go for us and for the ones who are trying to start it. What is your biggest hurdle? Yeah, the biggest hurdle is uh, what the student wants. 
finding what the student needs so it's not easy to connect with every students we have and to find their needs so it we have to adopt different methods for each of them and we have to like brainstorm how to get the student uh, get the students in get the person know how to know them and how to know their interests or how to know their abilities so each student uh, we don't have a standardized test like a iq test to uh, perform or uh, to get what student wants or their interests are so we have to first analyze how they are how their lifestyle and how are their condition uh, how are they living to in order to perform a test to check their abilities or their interests there were also a lot of logistical hurdles i would say um before the namibian partnership we were in talks with the nigerian organization and we had a lot of failed ideas because of the execution i think um having it online and like relying on someone else to do the groundwork makes it a little bit more difficult if the communication is not right um we've set, certainly faced that issues so i feel like moving forward if if once we get this going and have the resources just having a little bit of ground staff or support who can connect us and communicate our impact that would make things a lot easier maybe the flower and insect philosophy doesn't fit with your business model and i'll tell you why i say that when you're a college people are seeking you out because you're a college and those people have the resources to get to your college right they have the money to pay the fees they have the money for you to go and run your teachers on your front you're trying to serve the people who don't have money and you're trying to serve the community that may not have access to you that may not even know that you exist considering that to be an issue and yes having more people on the ground is helpful having those people in different nations is a whole different ball game which which is why at this point in time we've done like those partnerships like with david especially like he has a ground staff there so like leveraging the resources and connections that someone else has and they, because he also the reason i reached out to him was he had a similar youth mentorship model but i think he was looking for people to help with the mentorship so i found like oh this is what we can offer and they can offer us this so it works but i think the eventual dream would be to like have it going with like a lot of different countries and like a lot of different people who can help us with everything so initially uh, what they can do is finding the place where the students are more uh, so we can target government schools so initially what we did in india is we targeted the government schools and they have uh, so they don't have uh, re enough resources to learn but some of them has hunger to learn something new and more and so we targeted the government school students in india and then we went to each school and then we started to uh, we initially just started to teach some random topics of, for them and then we eventually realized that uh, some of them were like not interested in uh, getting to know about the random topics and then we developed the model of psychometric analysis how and identifying what students need to identify what the student needs so what i would suggest is initially go to a particular place or the in the schools uh, so school is where many students are there and we can reach to large group of students easily at the base level so initially we would uh, try to reach the schools and then we can use their help so some of the schools would have at least a computer as one single computer we can use them or as as a use the computer as a resource to teach them through online so initially targeting a school would be the first step for starting this according to me and what this is what we did i have heard psychometric analysis so many times now that i am very intrigued as to would you be open to sharing the playbook behind your psychometric analysis what exactly is it how did you come to it and like is it just a set of questions or is it like one question leads to the next or like what is it exactly so it's not a standardized question so it's not a standardized process so first what we do is we would group uh, if if a class suppose has a 40 students we would group in them as five students each and make eight groups 
and then we would be going to uh, so uh, we have some stud we have some volunteers and each volunteer would go and connect with the students initially to like just talking to some random stuffs with them and to getting connected with them in a personal level and then after that we what we do is just a, they, we want to know what their problems are so then we after connecting with them personally we would ask their problems so and what are the problems they face right now and what are the problems they want to solve and how do how are they are how are they going to solve it and then uh, so this is so first the problem so first getting connected with them personally and then asking about the problems they face and then after that we would be asking their interest how are you going to solve the problems or what are the tools are or what are the tools you will use or what is your imagination so they we would be asking the creativity so for example if you get a super power of uh, solving a problem uh, with your speed uh, what would you do first if you have a high if you can run fast as sound uh, what would you do first like that so and then uh, so it would enhance their create we would check their creativity level like that so we can after and um, their problem creativity and then their interest uh, in the analyzing their problems and the creativity we, we usually go for the interest so this is this is the steps we go for the psychometric analysis and then after getting to know about their interest and we would be asking do you know anything about this specific domain or the topic that you are going to work on and if they are not sure or if they are, so here we will check the knowledge level uh, so after checking the knowledge level we would be start uh, and again we would be shuffling the group and we can we would be doing this again so it would take like 5 days for just a uh, 3 days for just for the psychometric analysis for us we spoke to david and one of the major problems that every non profit faces is money and you talk about if we have the resources then we will do this if we have the resources we will do this and another issue becomes sustainability how long can our non profit go on because to go on you need more money what is your process of call it making money call it raising money call it getting money into the system for you to do whatever what's the process of that yeah to be completely honest with you guys we have not really i mean we have not made a whole lot of money a lot of our model is like even the staff that works for us we we all do this it's just like volunteering work for us so we do, we do not get paid or anything like that it's completely out of passion but i think moving forward we we have to find a viable model because now it's mostly like we're doing this online we're trying to tutor and the people who were helping us don't really charge us a lot So I think, except for like our website and costs, which we, which me and Sanjay had to cover, um, to to be honest, we don't have a financial model going going in right now. But that is something we definitely have to look into in the future. That's why I keep saying resources because I know money is a whole lot, a very big part of the piece, and we have a lot of ideas where we're kind of limited because we don't have the access to money. And um, since both of us are are in America. registering that here is a whole another game that we're we're kind of figuring things out so we can talk to people who can invest in us but yeah what we will be doing is use the we would be asking the students to uh, like using the knowledge they we teach them we would be making products uh, and various stuff so in india we made like in the q369 initiative we made like nine sustainable innovations like one is a pavement generator like mostly cons- uh, mini but they are worthier so we make the students to go for the innovative contests and we raise the money they we got uh, to run the uh, to help other students teach more so this is what we did in india but since it is mostly online for us right now in the sivich organization it's kind of difficult and we would after reaching a lot of students and making a progress and we would be like pitching to the venture capitalists and various founders and partnering with various non profits 
would help us to gain traction pitch it to venture capitalists they are going to want to know how they will make money in the future yeah if you pitch it to venture capitalists as a passion project they are going to want to know what do they gain out of it if not for money then what right so let's do it let's let's have a one minute pitch each you know just go for why somebody should be investing money in you we have a lot of students where we're going to come up with innovative projects and solutions like one of our one of our students came up with a rocking stick which had um ai in built into it so when when we're giving access to a lot of these students and coming up with their products we can make a lot of money in it money in it if we were to um sell it potentially and i think there is also a lot of benefits associated with with promoting this to students themselves because when when they're sorry when they're giving men, when they're given mentorship support the research papers that they publish the publications that that they publish and the research findings that they come up with they're all um you can sell all of those products i believe so would you be willing to sign a contract with them the students saying that whatever research they do and whatever they come up with would be owned by the organization not entirely of it like 30% or 20%. So you would essentially become a university or something like that where they have the thing right that anything that's developed within our premises or within when while you're a student here the university gets a share of it. No we won't compel anybody if they are willing for it they can go or or else we just teach them we'll just, anyways we are going to teach them the project or the skills but we are not we are not compelling them to do that. if they come for us voluntarily that we we would be here we are fine helping you with that then we would go for it we are not compelling anybody but then nobody has any incentive to give you a portion of whatever research they are doing i think it's a phenomenal model if you can actually sustain the model that you know what we are going to teach like millions of students with millions of research papers popping up all over the place in you know god knows how many different subjects and we will own all of those papers that becomes something that is potentially very investable that has like a time horizon of 10 years in 10 years we are going to kill it because we already have 5000 students what that also does is that it makes any venture capitalist any investor anyone who is looking at this say that okay out of 50000 ideas that i might get even if 5 are viable i make my money yeah how much is 5 out of 50000 that's 0.01% i agree with and anshu thought that the podcast is not going to help her think better <laughs> only science will <laughs> good luck but i don't know with i agree with you anshu you you walked into a trap today willingly walked into a trap today when you we have i you then you say things like podcast is not going to help what do we do no honestly i feel like the questions you guys are asking me it kind of makes me reflect but also with i had this whole idea of like yeah we are making products we're making research papers why not have that but it also gets into that question of like we're doing this to serve people and what if they're what if they're not comfortable with that so do we deny them the opportunity to do it with us like they don't want to publish it so should i just say no you're not allowed into this I'm not sure like uh, with all honesty I don't have a lot of answers to all these questions It's a fine balance the most common topic of discussion on this planet especially in finance is capitalism versus socialism Okay capitalistic society believes that everyone should do good for themselves and that does most good for the world socialist society believes that everyone should be kept in the same stead as everybody else nobody is special nobody should have more if you are able to produce these researches produce these amazing companies that might happen and own these researches own these ideas you will have more money to serve more kids who will produce more researches who will then give you more money to get it on the other hand 
if you don't own these and you don't have the money to keep going, you guys might go bust. Despite your efforts of wanting to help these people who you could have helped more and more and more and exponentially increase one country, 10 countries, 15 countries, or even just looking at India, let's go one town, 10 towns, 1000 towns. There's so many bloody people, right? So this thought has been tried and tested in historically. So let's go with your views. After listening to this, does that make a difference? It kind of does. I understand your main point of like, if I have more, I can give more. But I still feel like, what if, if I'm teaching like 20 kids? I understand what you're trying to say. Like, if I have a lot of resources, I have more money, then I can achieve my goal of like serving like probably 20 countries, 30 countries, whatever. But I'm not sure of like how, I don't know, how I'm going to impose it, whether like, what if someone's not comfortable? I still have the same question. What if someone doesn't, does not want to do it? Um, they, they might have their own reasons, but again, I feel like I'm not logical there. I'm kind of like coming from a personal emotional perspective because I, I deal with a lot of students who are not, even in the research facilities that I'm a part of, they're not comfortable sharing or that kind of stuff. So I don't know, maybe different personalities, different things. Why are they not comfortable? That's the first question you ask yourself. The first question you ask them. Now, most people are not comfortable because A, either they feel that their stuff is not good enough or B, they feel it's going to be used in a wrong way. Right? There can be, like, there's very rarely a third reason because if someone has a good idea and if someone has the execution of that good idea, there aren't really many other reasons why they don't want to go ahead. It's either my idea is not going to work because it's not good enough or someone's going to misuse it. So you have to find ways around both of those. And that is the, that is the job that you guys have now, because the moment you start scaling, the moment you're enabling people to do these wonderful things, what we are saying is take that enablement one step further. We're saying enable them. But here, what we're saying is that, okay, we're giving them the introduction and leaving them there. It's enable them to the extent that they're able to publish that paper or someone is able to take that idea and make a company out of it, make a product out of it. Today you have AI walking sticks. How much will that help people? Be it blind people, be it old people, be it so many things. If, if a walking stick is, has the ability to tell someone, okay, this is a, like a step is in front of you or the signal, the walking, like, you know, the, the signal to cross the street is red currently it's going to turn green that saves so much of the taxpayer money or the money that goes into the infrastructure to make those kind of things so there is just different ways of thinking the viewers are gonna think that we are trying to push these two people trying to run a non-profit into going like full bloodthirsty universities <laughs> oh no, no 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 not at all bro that is not what we're trying to do one bit we're saying take whatever people you have and you, but you're already enabling people to do X enable to enable them to do 10 X. Now I am pushing you into full bloodthirsty capitalism because see who is supporting all of the researchers doing PhD programs. It is the Pfizer's and the Merck's of the world. You know, it is the Microsoft of the world trying to push university research on AI because they know they're going to own it. But only because they're going to own it, do these guys have the resources to do it in the first place. I, I am a full, full on, like, push you into the capitalistic world because then you sustain and you can make a difference to so many new lives. Yeah, that really opened my mind. So I have a personal experience in that. So my innovation, I said the electricity generation is now was funded by my uh, I I don't have the enough resources to make buy everything or make the make it by alone. I have to f depend on someone or to help for the funding part, right? Since I'm I'm like from the uh, I'm from a middle class family, I don't have enough resources to buy them or access. So I have to depend on somebody. So the one who funded me is will, will be owning a part of it, even though I invented it completely. The one who funded me for you inventing that 
will be owning a part of it, right? So uh, that's not like he is doing injustice to me. He is getting what he uh, does to me. It's part of a giving back to him, right? So if we are, if the students are not comfortable in sharing their innovation, then that's fine. If they are comfortable, we would be going for it. We won't impose anybody on sharing their research or share the ownership of it. Does your college give you the option to not share your research? No, they don't. Why should you? Uh, so that's, that makes us quite different, right? So we are not imposing anything on anybody. We are helping them. So that's the main goal of our non-profit. I feel like Sanjay is not coming at it with a non-profit mindset. Yeah, non-profit. So we are going to help them. If they are okay with sharing or we will be asking them definitely. If they are okay and comfortable with that, then we would go ahead. If they are not, we won't impose anything on anybody. Sanjay. Today, why am I, if I am a student who is learning with you guys, what is motivating me to share my research with you if I'm, if there is no upside or there is no downside? Why will I willingly share my research? So some students would be like, uh, that's their innovation. So I won't share it with anyone. Like they would be like, uh, I made an effort for that. Right? Uh, so we won't impose them to share their ownership of innovation, but whoever, but most of them were, but I got a proof of concept for that while I was working with the Q369 initiative in India, the students who work with their innovation, since we helped them making it, they are willing to share their part, uh, so that we can gain more traction and then help others from that. So we, what we did is we helped mostly underprivileged students because they know the pain or the uh, what uh, how to do without being uh, resources that are inaccessible. So they helped to fund the others. Likewise, those who we are going to majorly focus on the underprivileged students, right? So they know the pain of not getting enough resources. How does it look like? So they eventually would, some of them would accept it. So underprivileged students are nicer than privileged students. I'm not saying that. Because they are nicer, they are going to be like, no. yes, please have some of my innovation. While if I was a privileged student, I would say that I'll use the teachers and I'll use your resources. But since you're giving me an out, I'm not really interested in giving you anything back. So are you good with that? No, I'm not saying like that. I'm saying that they know the pain. We know the pain of not getting... I feel like that was so controversial. We know the pain of how to make something without any resources. So we... Uh, so I'm not saying in generalized manner. Everyone would be different, even though despite of their backgrounds, right? Sanjay, that's the point we're trying to make. Do not leave it to chance. Everyone is different. Why not go halfway? Go... Okay, see, whatever you make, we own like 50% of it. You own the rest of it. But if you are really nice and you really understand that we gave you so many resources, just give us like 20 more percent. And that 20% is optional. Yeah, Alessandra, let's think about it later. In there, and she's bailing Sanjay out now. She realizes what's going on. <laughs> I'm like, guys, no, we're not doing this. But I don't know. I feel like there's so many pieces to it. You guys are giving us a free consultation. Why not? It's okay. We'll charge you for it later. <laughs> with, with, your, with equity in all of the research that you guys develop. Since you, since we, Sanjay, since we helped you, guys, you're, <laughs> you have to give us now. <laughs> you, know, you know the pain of building this without resources. So just give us like. I feel such a fan of capitalism. Give us like 10% of all the research you guys have in the future. I feel like Sanjay's going to say yes, just because he's a nice person. He's that nice person. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, I'm the, I'm the, you know, marketing person. Sanjay, please don't, don't interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like in general, Sanjay is just more nicer. Even I've seen with like in our meetings and stuff, like if someone makes a request, I'm like, I'm definitely not doing that. And he's like, let's just do it. He is Shah Rukh Khan from Swadesh. I am telling you, he's going to put a dam in every village in India. <laughs> oh, yeah. Guys, it was, it was absolutely awesome having you on the podcast. 
Oh my god, we have been recording for like one and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, and we we are gonna have to cut like forty minutes out of it because a lot of controversial topics, like God. Yeah, please. I can like I was thinking like oh I'm gonna post these podcast clips on my Instagram and I'm like what if I post science is better than the art <laughs> and my audience is like my audience is like aren't you like that? aren't you you have to. Like, I honestly, that you have to because that is like a stem I honestly have that opinion I honestly have that opinion like science is supreme to the arts and like if I post it I know 90% of the people there are gonna like wreck me and yet the podcast gave you a vision to actually monetize your thing <laughs> otherwise you guys would just be sitting there thinking why isn't anybody giving me their research you know <laughs> they just own all of it so guys we have a closing tradition on the podcast the previous guest has left you a question and we would love for you to leave a question for the next guest the question we have for you is what's the one thing that scares you the most but you keep on doing it sleeping is one thing that scares the most because i don't know if i wake up tomorrow or uh, so but still i keep doing that i've n- i've never thought about that but something i keep doing that scares me i think just chasing things that seem impossible within my own realm like for example with like stu- in the university setting of like student government or like setting up a company the the downside the chances of success are so limited um but i feel like just pushing pushing through it all maybe in the end it's not worth it maybe it is worth it and it seems very scary to me that what if i fail what if i'm average what if i what if it just doesn't work out right why am i doing it like let's just do a safe path but just i think the passion of wanting to do it makes me want to do it let's have one question each i would say my question is 